Hey class, so this is kind of a part two to the two lines of communication to help us understand a little bit more about uh, how they work together and especially how the personal line of communication uh, works within this whole thing. So uh, one of the things uh, that I'm gonna do here is once again, go with the diagram. I'm gonna try to be a little less wordy on this one to try to help us out visually to be able to get this. But one of the things we need to understand about Revelation is um, I guess the parameters with which, within which it works, especially our personal line. So I'm going to begin with a circle. And this circle represents my sphere or my ring of responsibility. Uh, this was referred to a few times by President Oaks uh, as he has taught about Revelation. And he says, when you and I receive revelation, we're going to receive revelation based on the responsibility that we have within our family, our calling, etc. So whatever revelation I receive, it needs to fall within that ring or sphere of responsibility. So I'm going to label this responsibility. All right. Um, now, there are, there are a couple other things we need to understand about our uh, revelation that comes within our sphere of responsibility. One is that sometimes our responsibilities will be such that we fall within concentric concentric rings of responsibility. Meaning, um, like I serve on the High Council currently, um, so that is my sphere of responsibility. I have responsibility over young men's seminaries and institutes, um, Boy Scouts, and uh, missionary preparation materials. And so that is uh, my sphere of responsibility within my calling. Now, over me in that calling is President Nelson, my, uh, excuse me, President Nielsen, my um, stake president. And so because he holds keys over me, I fall within his sphere of responsibility. And then he, fall, he falls within the sphere of responsibility of an area authority, Elder Nemro, and uh, so on. So I am a part of this concentric uh, sphere of responsibility. And that allows me to know how to govern myself. So I receive revelation specific to my uh, calling here, but remember how my personal line of revelation was within a general arrow or line of um, revelation, communication. Same thing is happening here. I'm working under the direction of my stake president who is working under the direction of Elder Nemro, who is using under the who, who is working under the keys of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. So those are the concentric rings. This is how we work sometimes within that uh, sphere of revelation. Another is what I refer to as overlapping rings of responsibility. So I'll take myself and my wife. And she and I, we work together to receive revelation as well. So there's this, I call it the sweet spot right there where she and I, um, we come together and I, I feel like we have this shared opportunity to receive pieces of the revelatory um, message and share in the revelatory experience as we work together as a couple. And so we know that revelation is spread amongst us. How does that work? Well, this is one of those ways. So she and I are working together to receive revelation for our family. You also notice that kids play a role in this as well, right? Because here's, you know, my son Jonah. And right now he's receiving personal revelation for himself. But because he's within our stewardship, we're also receiving revelation for him. And so we've got dad, we've got mom, we've got son. And then once again, here's this great sweet spot here where we're all trying to come together um, and bring our insights and promptings to help make the right decisions. And uh, as he gets older and um, becomes more spiritually self-sufficient and mature in the gospel, then what will happen is his sphere of responsibility will start to uh, leave ours. And I don't think we'll ever lose responsibility. We'll always be connected in some way and be able to help out in that revelatory process with him. But he's going to become more autonomous in his uh, spiritual abilities to do this. And then of course, he's going to get married and uh, the, he will have shared 
revelatory responsibility with his wife as well. So um, anyway, I wanted to bring up those two aspects when it comes to just responsibility in Revelation. So any promptings, inspirations that I think I might have that comes outside of that sphere of responsibility, I need to be very careful about because odds are pretty good that it's probably coming from the wrong source. And as I mentioned before, probably sinspiration rather than inspiration, things that Satan would like me to do to uh, get me away from the, the actual target. So to understand how this works, once I do, okay, this is in my sphere of responsibility, I'm going to divide this into four sections. And for me, uh, understanding Revelation, there's four basic components to um, Revelation. The first one is what President Nelson has asked us to do um, in general conference. So April uh, 2018, he has said to each of us, he says, we must learn to receive revelation. And then he gave us some very specific things that we need to do to receive revelation in our own lives. And that's step number one. We just got to receive it. So that's a matter of being willing and worthy to uh, receive and do the will of the Lord. Well, that moves us into our next step, which uh, many times, this is the one that I've noticed people get hung up a lot. And I think Elder Bednar has been doing a good job helping us understand um, how this works in our life. This one is... to recognize the revelation. So, okay, now I'm willing and worthy and I'm receiving it, but now how do I recognize it? How do I know if it's me uh, talking to myself in my head or if that's God prompting me, inspiring me to do something? And uh, unfortunately, we start to put on the brakes and we start second guessing, who is that? Is that me or is that God? One of the things he's told us to do is he says, hey, let's stop putting on the brakes because it's hard for God to steer a parked car. So we need to make sure that our foot is on the gas so he can steer us where we need to go. And so he loves referring to Moroni chapter 7, where we learn that those things that are good cause us to believe in God. Uh, they come from the Holy Ghost. And so he says pretty much his default rule is this. If it is good, then it is of God, right? It's like built right into the word. So he says, rather than saying, oh, is that me or is that God? Just ask yourself. Is it good? Is it bad? Does it fall within my sphere of responsibility? Hey, if it's good, I'm going to go for it. Let God steer me, and I'm going to move that direction. He says, usually what will happen is when you get to the next step, you'll realize, you'll go back, and you'll say, oh, that was God. And, and it will be, because due to your divine nature, you come with that innate goodness within you as well. So number one, we've got to receive. Number two, we have to recognize it. And uh, rather than once again asking ourselves over and over, is that me or is that God? Let's just evaluate the decision. Is it good? Is that something I should be doing? Does it have righteous motives? Then let's move in that direction and make sure that it happens. Number three is good old President Monson. And one of the things that he loved to teach us was that we should never postpone a prompting. So this one is to respond. And that's what uh, Elder Bednar was saying. He's like, just, just do it, and then you'll be able to look back and recognize that it really was God. And you'll remember some of the stories that um, President Monson has shared with us to, to just emphasize never postpone a prompting. One of those was as a young bishop, and he's sitting up on the stand during a stake meeting, and he gets the prompting to visit a member of his ward that's in the hospital, and he just thinks, oh, I'll just wait, I'll just wait, I'll get out of here as soon as it's done. And then as soon as the meeting's done, he gets out of there, he's running down the hallway of the hospital, and uh, someone calls to him and says, are you Bishop Monson? And he says, yeah, how did you know? And uh, they let him know that the person had just passed away and that they were calling for him prior to passing away. And that just left President Monson heartbroken and with the feeling that I should never postpone a prompting. Well, another experience they uses to counterbalance that is while he was swimming um, one day, and President Monson loved to swim, he had the impression come to him that he needed to visit one of his friends who was in, recovering in the hospital. And um, it, you think about that, that's another good way to recognize is, would I normally be thinking that right now? While I'm swimming, would I be thinking about my buddy? I like swimming, would I be thinking I need to get out of the pool and go visit him? And uh, so anyway, he, he loved that rule, never postpone a prompting. He gets out of his pool, 
gets dressed, goes to visit his buddy. Gets there, uh, he's not in his room, so he asks where maybe he could find his friend, and uh, he's directed to the pool area. When he gets there, his friend is near the deep end of the pool in a wheelchair, and uh, he calls to him, and they begin a conversation. And as a part of that experience, President Monson learned that his friend had been contemplating taking his own life because of the situation that he was in. And once again, President Monson was very grateful that he had not postponed the prompting and that he was able to be there to help his friend. So when those good thoughts come, let's make sure that we act on them and let God steer us. The final one that I'm going to hit here comes from Elder Scott. And Elder Scott was a, a huge advocate of this step, number four. Which is that we need to remember the spiritual experiences that we've had. As we remember those spiritual experiences, it does a couple good things. It gives us confidence to be able to receive, recognize, and respond in the future. Another is it allows us to build uh, trust uh, with Heavenly Father, not, not so much Him trusting us, He trusts us, right? But that we get to trust in Him, in allowing Him to guide us. Uh, we also get to help other people learn how revelation works as we share our experiences and remember those. We can help build their testimonies. And so this is, is fairly, you know, fairly sim simplified version or a pattern of how to understand revelation. But I, the reason I like it is you can base it on the letters re to help you remember um, how revelation can work so when president nelson says we need to learn to receive revelation well what are the other parts of that we need to remember that it will fall within the responsibility that we have we need to remember that when it's coming rather than say well is that me or is that god we can just evaluate the decision and if it's good we can act on it and start responding and as we respond to those we'll be able to have significant spiritual experiences that somehow we need to record or remember and allow ourselves to grow in confidence with the Lord, grow in trust, share those experiences with others, and deepen our own testimony, you know, and conversion through these experiences. So I hope this can help as we um, try to understand how this personal line of revelation fits within the priesthood line of communication. And if I were to draw that one more time, this would be my personal line of communication. But within all of this would be the priesthood line. So I need to make sure that all of this falls within what I've already been taught in the scriptures and the words of the prophets. And as I stay within the general teachings of the church, I can be um, more confident that the specific revelations that I'm receiving to help me with my specific concerns, questions, difficulties, trials, problems, are in line with the Lord's will, rather than second-guessing those. Again, I want to bear witness of the reality of our Savior Jesus Christ, that it's because of His atonement that we have the opportunity to be able to receive revelation, that we can access the Holy Ghost in our life, and receive the inspiration that we need to be able to become more like our Savior Jesus Christ. I'm grateful for Him, for His atonement. I'm grateful for the Holy Ghost's role in helping us to become more like the Savior and do our Heavenly Father's will so that we can prepare to live with them again. And I bear that witness to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.